Hello and welcome to the Space News Commercial Space Transformers series, where we aim to give you a behind the scenes look at the people and companies driving the space industry's commercial transformation. I'm Jason Rainbow, Senior Staff Writer at Space News, and today I'll be talking to Don Clausen, CEO of Ground Network Specialist ST Engineering iDirect. The space segment of the satellite industry often gets all the attention, but advancing capabilities in orbit would not be possible without innovation on the ground, and ST Engineering iDirect is at the forefront here. Next year, they'll be launching their next generation ground system, Intuition which will leverage the latest AI and virtualized tools to support increasingly complex multi-orbit networks. Well, Don, thank you very much for joining me today to talk about the ground segment and all the advances that are taking place there to enable all the cool things happening in space and, and on, on Earth too. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you again. So I've got a few questions um, to throw your way. Let's let's start with just what are the advances being made in the ground segment to enable all those next generation capabilities we hear about um, going on in space? And, and what are some of the, the key trends to look out for? Well, the last two or three years, uh, space, is, space communications in particular has really accelerated as we talk about at all the conferences. Uh, and I, I know we'll probably get into the new entrants later. They've really pushed us to think in a different way uh, you know specifically and we all kind of talk about these same things but now we're getting to a point where we're actually uh, seeing progress and we're seeing new advances come into the the traditional satcom space you know the first thing is a, adoption of virtualization we i think we've all realized that that's critical to scale uh, and provide the flexibility that our customers need uh, with more people coming into the networks uh, our customers need to be able to uh, increase the number of subscribers that they can take into their network over a given period of time. You know, in the past, we've been very static. You you would think about how big your network would be or how many subscribers you would be, and you would just build for that, right? And uh, now we're in this, this space where by virtualizing and, and being less, uh, I call it addicted to bespoke hardware using more commoditized solutions, we enable that growth and scalability and allow our customers to be more flexible in deployment. Um, really what's, you know, we're going to see over the next two or three years is the real-time resource orchestration. In the past, it's been very static. You set up your network, you know, we started with fixed networks and we moved to mobile networks. Uh, people are moving in and out of the network, but it's really based on maps that are you know, predetermined and beam patterns that are predetermined for the network. Um, so it's, even though it seems dynamic, it's more dynamic than it used to be. It's really quite static. And I mm -hmm. think we see not only um, progress there of more dynamic networks from a, uh, how it affects the end users coming in and out of the network or switching beams or even switching satellites, but uh, being able to operate across multiple orbits. So that's really key for what's going on in the industry now. Uh, and then standardization, you know, we've, we all talk about standardization, especially for the last two years, uh, but you have things like Diffie and Wave that are really starting to uh, gain traction in the entire community and push those standards. If we don't get to those standards, the interoperability that I'm sure we're also gonna talk about is not gonna happen, right? You've got a whole bunch of bespoke solutions that don't really interoperate with each other. And, and I, as I've said in the past, this is where we can learn our lessons from networking protocols and what the mobile wireless industry has done over the last two decades. Uh, and then I think um, the next key piece of that, that it really enables the resource orchestration and the scalability and the flexibility is driving automation and analytics or what some people refer to as uh, artificial intelligence into the network. Uh, the scale that these networks are going to operate in and across multiple orbits are really going to require automation to be able to run smoothly and and make the end users experience something that they expect yeah and you mentioned the market entrance here market disruptors like uh starlink have reshaped the satellite industry what would you say are the the kind of main norms that have changed and what lessons could and can others in the satellite sector draw from their approach? Yeah, I think we learned that we had to um, step back and innovate faster. Um, the space is hard, right? Uh, so we've kind of been risk adverse for a long time and we haven't iteratively 
created technology or we weren't flexible in our our development methodologies because it was so hard you spend a lot of money to put an asset on orbit uh you you don't want to take a lot of risks everything's very planned out so the first point i think the new entrants are really driving is that more uh silicon valley type technology disruptor uh attitude which means we're shifting from static long life cycle deployments to more flexible solutions uh, that upgrade over time and provide new capabilities. It, you know, I've been in this industry for almost 25 years, and I know there's some networks that I deployed 20 years ago that are still out there that are, that are the wow. same they were 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, that's not okay going forward because we've lived in this age of cell phones, uh, these mobile devices where we get updates quite periodically that add new features and services, uh, that's going to be expected. And these new entrants are really driving that. So I think it was critical for this industry to have that new thought process uh, almost forced upon us so that we could innovate. And, and I think we see that in the industry right now. And that's why it's exciting right now is because we're moving faster because we have to. Yeah. Um, what is what would you say are the, the, the most pressing challenges your satellite customers are facing? And, and what, what is ST Engineering and iDirect doing to, to support them in addressing these issues? Where, where is innovation most needed, I guess, is another way of saying that. Yeah, so the, the first part of that is going to be operating across multiple orbits. It's not as easy every, as everybody thinks because you have open uh, architectures, you have closed architectures. Um, you have competitors trying to get the same market share uh, in these different segments or, or these different orbits for different market segments. Uh, you, we're starting to see consolidation where traditional operators do have a multi-orbit capability, um, but the, the ones that don't, they're still competing with other orbits while they're trying to address their customer base. So being able to adapt as a ground systems provider and and allow our customers whether they're global or regional operators or service providers to provide all the solutions to their customers and operate across those i think that's challenge number one uh, and that goes into the complexity that i talked about earlier so we really have to be focused on reducing the operational overhead and complexity that that adds because now you're not operating just across multiple orbits which is hard enough you're, you have all these subscribers that are going to come in. And so the scale that you're operating those networks is much different. Uh, and, and you've got to do all that and make it seamless to the end user or they're going to find some other technology. Uh, and then finally, you know, it's just competing with the vertically integrated solutions because um, it's not just competing, it's being able to work with those solutions as well. We have to be very flexible in our approach so that we can enable our customers you know, the way we're, we're supporting that or, or addressing that is one with the launch of intuition. Uh, mm -hmm. It is built from the beginning to be scalable and flexible. Uh, I've spent the first year uh, just learning from our customers that I, I was the CEO of uh, iDirect. My first year was learning from the customers. And then I've spent a lot of this year meeting with them and understanding what their strategy is to co compete with their traditional and non-traditional competitors and it all comes down to scalable growth um adding these these uh new subscribers but being able to do it in a flexible model not having all the capex outlay all at once being able to grow as their subscriber base grows um and then of course for interoperability we're very um focused on standards like 3GPP and the WAVE Consortium uh, and working with what were traditionally our competitors on ensuring that we can interoperate uh, because our customers expect that we're going to get there and we're going to be able to interoperate. Um, I think that is a, a, a step that has to occur to achieve this multi-orbit flexible network. Um, and then, you know, we're really putting a lot of focus on automation. We know that automation is key because not, not just to, to operate the network, but it unlocks more business potential for us and our customers because we have a lot of information on what's going on uh, with their consumers of their products. We know uh, when ships are coming into port. We know when they're leaving. We know patterns of life. We know when their con consumption is highest, what they're consuming. So 
being a, able to take all this information in and organize it and produce something that's that's useful uh, is really critical. It's something that we need to do. Um, you know, people quite frequently ask, ask me, you know, how do you really address this? And it's because we address it by focusing on four key pillars. Uh, the first one is virtualization. I've talked a lot about that. Digitization, which is, you know, moving from um, uh, these static gateways that only service one beam or one area of the network or one set of subscribers to being able to be more flexible and move that around. Uh, automation, which I talked a lot about. Uh, providing more information to our customers and being able to automate a lot of processes. And then all of it's wrapped up in standardization. So we're really focused on those four things. mentioned artificial intelligence being one of those tools in the toolkit that are helping you to advance um, you know your offering and, and the, the capabilities of the of the industry um, just in terms of what's possible today and what you see coming on the horizon how are you planning on leveraging AI to to you know meet all these uh, incoming demands yeah, I think the best way to do that is to, to tell you know answer that question is provide some context. So, if you think about uh, the new spacecraft going on orbit, they flexible beams, right? I started in this industry and you had global beams, very large beams, and then we went to smaller beams, kind of a cellular model. Um, and now, but those beams were largely planned, and you knew where the contour lines were going to be for those beams. Now we're going to have the capability to reshape beams as we need it. So just one example use case for, for artificial intelligence or automation is if you're detecting the patterns of life within a network and you have a whole bunch of aircraft going through an area and coming out of an area or vessels, ships, cruise ships, uh, instead of having somebody watching a screen or, or pre-planning this, it can say, okay, I can take capacity from area A and put it in area B, because I know I have a whole bunch of people going from London to New York at this time, right? Or I know the cruise ships are leaving port out of Hoboken, New Jersey uh, on Sunday evening at six o'clock. I know I need capacity here, but I know by tomorrow, they're gonna be in this other area. And it can just start to automate and learn those tasks. And I think that is a critical, com critical component as more people come into the satellite networks, because one of the things that I think we have learned and uh, consumers have learned is that terrestrial wireless cannot give them connectivity everywhere the way they expect it to. So they're coming to satellite, right? They're coming to satellite communications because uh, we can bridge that gap and it's becoming more affordable. So that's that's one example of how we're looking at using artificial intelligence. Very good, thank you. And um, you spoke a lot about the need for greater collaboration in the industry, particularly um, how standards are, are the are critical enabler for the satellite ecosystem. What external pressures are challenging this need for a, a mindset shift, maybe um, to describe it in, in the satellite industry? And you know, why why is this transformation so urgent? Uh, it's all about integration. So people expect to be connected all the time. If you go back 15 or 20 years, uh, you got on an airplane and it was kind of like the no access zone, right? You read a book or you watched a movie if it was capable. Now people expect to be online. So you go from your house into your car, into the airport, into an airplane, and you expect to be connected the entire time. Right now, that's not very seamless. It's, you know, you're doing a whole bunch of things along the way. Uh, the only way we get to the seamless experience where you're switching from the terrestrial network uh, onto another terrestrial network, uh, onto a satellite network between beams, between satellites, between orbits is through standardization. It can't happen any other way. And uh, the example I like to use is 20 years ago when I would travel to the Middle East, I would have to buy a cell phone in the airport when I got to Dubai or Doha. 
And I would use that cell phone while I was there. Now I fly wherever I want in the world and I turn my cell phone on and I get a text message saying, hey, you're going to pay this much a day and you get, you know, this many gigabits or megabits per second or megabytes. Um, that's where we need to go to. And we can't get there if we're not standardized. The other part of that is, you know, looking at the market realistically. Um, again, if we go back decades, uh, as I mentioned, these satellite networks were well thought out and well planned in advance. So you would choose a ground systems provider and they would provide, you would come to somebody like iDirect and we would provide the entire ground system for you. Now that doesn't really happen. All operators have a dual vendor solution. So if I'm an operator and I have vendor A and vendor B and I can't move between those networks and interoperate between those, it kind of causes a challenge for me. Right. And that's something that I direct is is open to and focused on resolving uh, because the networks are going to be so large and so uh, so useful to so many people that there's there's enough market for all of us. Of course, we all want our unfair share of the market, but I think we unlock more of the market if we interoperate and it's better for all of us. So I think that's where where uh, standards really come in. Um, what we're missing right now is I don't think everybody's on board yet, right? We talk about it. We say the same things at all the conferences or, or in magazines or in webinars and podcasts, uh, but we're not quite there yet. So uh, I've heard it loud and clear from our customers that they desire this and they expect it. So we're really focused on it. Uh, I think the other thing that, that we need in the industry is we need um, the telco industry to come in uh, in a, a more meaningful way, a bigger way, and really engage us and say, okay, this is what our plan is. This is how we're going to utilize you. This is how we need to interoperate with you. That's We're having discussions in the industry with the large telco providers, but uh, once we really start to work together to define that standard, how that's going to operate, I think it's going to move a lot faster. Um, but it's all kind of new still, right? If you think of uh, you know, we talk about how slow the satellite industry has been. We're making a lot of progress quickly. We just have some more steps that we have to go to go through. Right, right. And we're seeing a lot of advances in the um, direct to smartphone market at the moment. Do you think that's going to help facilitate this this integration to bring telcos to the, um, the negotiating table? Uh, I hope so. I, and I, I think it will, because, you know, going back to the scenario that I used before is you leave your home and you're on your your Wi-Fi, right? That's provided probably by a telco, maybe by a telco in a lot of instances. Then you're in your your car and you're on mobile wireless provided by a telco. And then you get on the airplane and uh, you're connected via satellite provider, a, a global or regional operator or a service provider. Um them being able to offer a solution where their phones or their devices or their service can roam is in their best interest. And I think they know that. So the directed device probably helps accelerate that because that is a that is that's not an abstract uh, business case or use case. Right. That is I have a device. I've given somebody a device. They're on my network. They also need to be on this other network sometimes. So I, I'm I'm very hopeful, and I do think that that will help drive um, the collaboration between the satellite communications industry and the telco industry. And and I think the other piece that you see, and we're doing this here at iDirect, but if if you look at the leadership changes made in the industry, a lot of the new CEOs are from telco, right? Right. And uh, my staff, the new the people that we've brought in over the last two years, we're bringing a lot of telco people in. And there's a reason for that. And I think that's very important because we get we get a, a mind shift that occurs quicker because you have people that can provide context and experience. Very good. All right. That's a great place to leave it. Thank you so much, John. I appreciate that. Um, Thank you. Fascinating stuff and stuff that's very close on the horizon, it seems. So that's good news. All right. Thanks.